Welcome to Property Question Time with me, Emily Evans. This is the programme where you get to ask our property experts your property questions. And today, our experts are Tim Stallard, Operations Director of Auction House Essex, Stefano Lucatello, Senior Partner of international law firm Cobot Law, and Tom Maloney from Age Partnership. Thank you for being with us today. So the first question is for you, Tim. What are the required documents I need to get before buying a property at auction? Okay, the, the first thing that I'd like to say is phone the auction house that you're going to purchase from and check with them first, because it may be slightly different depending on who you're purchasing from. Um, but to break that down into a couple of sections, uh, they'll all have to do money laundering checks, uh, make sure that you are who you say you are, um, the guidelines on this aren't particularly strict, you just have to show due diligence, so it will vary between the different auction halls, but most of them will be looking for a piece of photographic ID, so passport or driving licence, and proof of address, probably dated within the three months or, or a year if it's a council tax bill. Um, in terms of documents, normally that's pretty much all you'd have to bring, but there is other stuff that you need to bring along with you to auction, so I'll just expand on it a little. Um, probably the most important thing is you're going to need a method of payment. A lot of people don't realise that they're going to be taking a deposit in the auction hall. It'll be 10% most likely, um, and possibly any admin fee or buyer's premium as well. Uh, another thing that you really should be bringing along is your solicitor's details. You exchange contracts at the auction. So if you've got your solicitor's details there and ready, it will give you just that little head start because the conveyancing for an auction sale is typically 28 days. So you need to be moving quickly. So bring your solicitor's details so they can get that put on the memorandums of sale and done straight away. Just saves you some time. Uh, the one more thing that I probably would recommend, uh, obviously again, check with your auction house, but with some lots they may want proof of funds as well. So always phone up, check, tell them what property you're going to bid on um, and they'll tell you everything that you need. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so next question is for you, Stefani. We bought a plot of land for a barn conversion nearly six years ago. Together with this plot of land was, an, was additional land attached to it. We have been using this additional land as a garden for the barn conversion for over five years now. Can anyone tell me in planning law if this additional land can now be classed as our garden? Well, I don't see a problem with the additional land being classed as a garden because once it's yours, unless there is a particular restriction on the title which says that this plot of land cannot be used for one of the following reasons, one being a garden, then you should be able to use it as a garden. But what you do within the curtilage of your own land is your own problem. Uh, you can do what you like, basically. So, if at the end of the day you have been using it since day one as your garden and it touches the land that you have built your barn conversion on, then there shouldn't be a problem whatsoever. There isn't a, plon a, there isn't a planning point here to answer, I don't think. It's more of a land usage uh, question and what the title deeds say. Uh, if, of course, the title deeds say that it can't be used as a garden, then, of course, you can't use it, unless, of course, you were to get, I don't know, an indemnity insurance policy uh, and if someone comes along and then says you're using that as a garden then this indemnity insurance policy will mature for the value of the price that you paid for the garden. But I don't think that's the question that he wants to answer, have answered. I think the, the, the short and sweet answer is yes, unless the title deeds say otherwise. Thank you very much for that. So next question is for you Tom. My wife has recently had issues with her mobility and it looks like we will need to either make some modifications to the house or be forced to move. Oh, not a nice situation to be in. We don't have the funds and don't know where to start. We apparently don't qualify for any grants or benefits. Is there anything we can do? Well, first of all, obviously, I'm, I'm sad to hear that the viewer's health has deteriorated, but hopefully the good news is there probably is help out there. Um, my first suggestion would be to get in touch with an organisation called Foundations. Foundations oversee all of the home improvement agencies across the UK. Um, if they jump on the Foundations website, they should be able to identify where their local home improvement agency is. If they give them a call, they'll be able to go out and, and just 100% make sure that they're not eligible for any grants 
uh, or means-tested loans or anything else that may be available. Um, I think the other benefit of that, even if foundations or the Home Improvement Agency can't facilitate a grant to do the works, they may be able to point them in the right direction to the builders and contractors that ultimately might be able to support it. So I suppose if the answer is no, um, you can't get a grant or you can only get a grant for some of the money, then again you're back into the realm of thinking about how you can get your hands on that money commercially. That could be a secured loan, it could be a normal mortgage, or in many cases it's, it's a lifetime mortgage. In actual fact, 64% of all the people who engage with lifetime mortgages right now are doing so for home improvements or home adaptions. So this is one of the main reasons why people utilise lifetime mortgages or, or equity release. Um, I would say again, um, they, they should go get themselves some advice from foundations, establish what's available for them, and then once they know what's there or not there, then they'll be in a position to engage with a, a financial advisor who will hopefully be able to walk them through the range of options that they, they should be able to consider. And I suppose something for them to consider is actually their moving is going to be costly enough as it is with regards to state agency fees, solicitors, stamp duty if they're going on. I, I think from experience, it, it, for people in poor health, it, it's not even the cost, it's the hassle of moving, it's the disruption of having to pack up and move house. If you think you're in a home that with some adaptions can be suitable for you for the rest of your retirement, why go through the hassle of a move when you can just adapt the house and make it more, more suitable for you? But I really would suggest jumping on the Foundation's website and find the details of your local home improvement agency and hopefully they'll be able to steer them in the right direction. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and to finish us off um, for, before the break, um, we have a golden nugget from you, Tim. Yes. Um, so a lot of people tend to, to miss out on a property that they want at auction. Uh, and you phone them the following day and say, where were you? I'm terribly sorry I couldn't make it. So I'd like to highlight the alternative methods of bidding. Because if you can't make it to the auction hall, the auctioneers will be able to provide an alternative means for you to be able to still take part. Um, still, ideally, be in the auction hall. There's no substitute for being in the room. That's the best way to bid, best way to get a feel for the room. However, you can do a few things, uh, one of which is proxy bidding. That's where you give the auctioneer your maximum bid. They will ask for you to, they will ask to take your deposit because they'll need to transact that sale if your bid is the highest. Um, and they will bid on your behalf up until the limit of your proxy bidding. They will try and get it for you cheaper if they can, um, but if not, they will continue bidding up until that maximum, maximum figure that you've given them. Um, another option is online bidding. Uh, in today's world, everything is online. Uh, a lot of auctions are streamed online and most auctioneers will have a function where you can bid online. Um, that's great because you know, you've got control of it. Uh, however, if the internet goes down, you can't bid. You know, it's as simple as that. So, uh, although it's great, if that's, your, if that's the option that's available to you, then by all means go for it. But I'm always just a little bit wary that the technology could let you down. Um, the best of the alternative methods would be a telephone bid. Uh, so it's done much in a similar way to a proxy bid, whereby you talk to the auctioneer beforehand, um, you'll give them your deposit monies up to the limit on which you plan, plan on spending. So if you say to them, I'm probably going to bid up to around 100,000, you'll give them the 10,000 pound deposit. Obviously, if you're unsuccessful, they'll endeavour to return that to you as soon as they possibly can after the auction. Um, and then what you'll get is one of the negotiators will phone you up, probably the lot beforehand, and will talk you through it. Um, the reason I feel that's the winner is because you still get a little gauge of what's going on in the room. Um, it's nice if you, if you know the negotiator, so you've got a bit of a rapport and you understand each, each other better. Um, and it's just a good way to still get your bids through into the room. Most of the time as well, in my experiences, you can hear the auction going through the phone and you don't even really need the negotiator to do anything other than stick their hand up on your behalf. Um, so there are alternative means and if there's a property that you want that's being offered in auction and you can't make it, you know, just get another means sorted because you don't want to miss out. You see it all the time. People say, oh, I'd have bought it for more than that. Uh, I just couldn't make it on the day. Well, it was only a phone call and you still could have purchased it. That being said, if you can make it to the room, please do because I think that's where you get the best chance of winning uh, and the best chance of influencing the others in the room to make sure you get it at the price that you want. Thank you very much.
That's all we have time for right now, but bear with us, we'll be back with you after this short break. Welcome back to Property Question Time with me, Emily Evans. Today I have with me Tim Stallard, Stefano Lucatello and Tom Maloney. And we're going to start off with a golden nugget from you, Tom. Um, a lot of people who take out lifetime mortgages where monthly payments aren't required assume that the only option they have is to allow the interest to roll up over time. More and more of the plans that are on offer now, Emily, allow clients to make voluntary overpayments. That means that whether clients can serve us some or all of the interest, whether that's on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, every six or 12 months, it also means you can go wider than the clients themselves. So in many instances, the family can come together to service the interest on that particular loan. And as a result, the cost of borrowing over time will come down dramatically if they're servicing at least some, if not all, of the interest over time as opposed to allowing it all to roll up. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you very much. So first question is for you, Stefano. Closing down French tax liability. How to? We are shortly returning to the UK and will cease to be tax residents in France. Is there any particular procedure we need to follow in order to formalise this in a letter, email or visit to the office? We understand that we will still have to, a tax bill for the current year. Uh, right, Emily. With any jurisdiction, when you leave it, you should make sure in person that you go to visit the tax office, where, the, your local tax office. Why? Because you will have hopefully built up a relationship with this tax office over the years and you will no doubt know someone in that office that you can talk to. So the first thing to do is to write to them and then follow that up with a visit, have an appointment and say to them we are leaving whenever it is you're leaving and tell them exactly what you will be doing. And you will have to close your tax affairs off in France. You will do that by telling them exactly what you have, where you're going, and it will always be the case that when you've left the jurisdiction, so in this case left France, you will have a tax return to file even after you've left France and gone back to the United Kingdom. So some months later, maximum of 12 months later, you'll have to file a, a closing tax return. Uh, the answer to the question in short is yes, do everything that you would do here to tell the authorities that you are leaving and that you're going away. And also the important thing also is the other side of the coin, which is to tell the authorities that you're going to, that you are coming back to the jurisdiction and that you will from whatever date be tax resident in the United Kingdom so that the tax authorities here have you back on the radar and they don't think you're still abroad uh, for address purposes. And also when you're leaving France, for example, tell the water, the gas, the electricity, the telephone, the rates, people, whatever, because it could very well be the case that if you don't say anything at all and just send a letter, it will be lost in their administration process and that they continue to send you uh, bills unpaid, uh, a bill, sorry, to pay, they remain unpaid and then they will tax you. The French have a way of penalty taxing you, late interest, and if you don't pay, they can even take you to court and then the next thing you could find is that you are served with um, a uh, writ which may not come to England. It'll only go to your French, or, uh, French uh, address. You may not be there anymore. So it could then become a judgment in France which could then be served on you uh, in, in England. Worst case scenario is that a current client of mine many years ago for Italy left the jurisdiction and he came back to Italy some years later on holiday and was stopped at the frontier because he had an outstanding tax return which he knew nothing whatsoever about because he'd failed to talk to the tax authorities in Italy when he'd left. So beware. Wow, so the importance of leaving a forwarding address. I think we've all been there. But yeah, leave, him, leave a forwarding address. Thank you very much. Um, so next question is for you, Tim. Hi. <laughs> Hoping someone can shed some light for me on a property that recently went to auction but went unsold. The same property is now listed in a local agent's window with a reserve price on it. The reserve price is higher than the guide price at the auction. Is it still possible to make an offer on it or does the reserve now mean they will accept no lower offer? Okay. Um, I think it's always worth making an offer. Um, if there's something that you, if there's a property that you're looking at and you want to get it for a certain price and it's say five thousand pounds below what it, it's being advertised for, it's still worth making the offer. Um, the worst thing that can possibly happen is you get told no. Um, so why not go for it? 
Um, in this instance, it sounds to me like the price that's being advertised with the agent is what the reserve was in the auction. Uh, and just, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but just to quickly highlight that, the guide price for an auction property will also have a reserve price which is confidential between the auctioneer and the vendor, but that reserve price has to be within 10% of the guide price. So to go back to this example, um, it's not got any figures there, so let's just uh, make an assumption that it's £100,000, because the maths is nice and easy, <laughs> okay? And it's now being advertised for 110000 with the estate agent. I'd almost guarantee that the reserve when it went to auction was 110000 If that property is being advertised for 112000 then I would most definitely advise, you know, you can make an offer of 110000 Personally, I'd start lower, um, but you would expect that the vendor would be willing to accept 110. If they had that property in an auction with a guide price of 100,000, you know they're happy to accept 110. Um, so yeah, make the offer, why not? Um, like I said, the worst that can happen is they'll say no. Um, and from that point, you just begin negotiating until you get to a price that you're both happy with. That's really interesting. Is it across the board with all auction houses that the reserve is always within 10% of um, the guide price? You've got a couple of different uh, variations in the sense that sometimes you may have seen a range, a guide price range. Yeah. Uh, so let's say it was 200 to 220,000 pounds. The reserve must sit anywhere within that. Um, when you have a single figure guide, the reserve has to be within 10% of that guide price. Um, and that's, that, that's uh, what's given to you by the Rick's Common Auction conditions, um, that that's how it, it has to work. Um, so yes, it, it will be across the board on all of them. I feel that's a really good top tip. I'm going to take that away with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant. So over to Tom for your final question. I have an interest-only mortgage. My bank has told me that it's due to mature and the mortgage loan is now payable, but we don't have the money to pay for it. I'm worried we might lose our home. Do I have any options? I'm glad this question's come up because this is a predicament a lot of people are finding themselves in right now. The equity release industry actually right now, one in four of all the plans they're setting up are to repay interest only mortgages. There's a couple of things I would advise the clients to do. Firstly, speak to your lender. Go talk to the bank. I know our natural reaction is to kind of put our heads in the sand and ignore the phone calls and letters, but I would say engage with them. Understand what options they have for you so that you know what you can do moving forward. The second thing would be on a lighter note, um, for example, the Money Advice Service has some fantastic literature that can help guide you through the thought process you should have in, in trying to figure out how you're going to manage this mortgage that you, you have at the end of its term. And then the final piece, again, is to go get some really good advice. Find yourself a specialist advisor who can look at all of the options for you. The great news is that just because your existing mortgage provider hasn't got a suitable product for you doesn't mean there's not another mortgage provider out there who would be willing to take you on. Fantastically, in the last few years, we've seen particularly the building society sector getting more and more flexible with regards to older borrowers and borrowers that are at the end of the term of their mortgage and the equity release space, the lifetime mortgage providers have been working frantically to design products that can meet the need of, of older clients whose mortgage has come to the end of its term. So like I said, speak to your lender, figure out what they can do for you and then once you understand what position you're in, go find yourself a really good advisor who can walk you through the options and hopefully you'll find an alternative. But hopefully you'll, your endowment will have some value because like most of us who took out mortgages in the 80s, we were told to get an endowment policy and then when the endowment policy matures, it doesn't mature for the amount it says it should have matured to pay off your mortgage. I, I think the challenge in this space right now is that the, we estimate that one in ten of all interest only mortgages have no repayment vehicle whatsoever and even of those who have a repayment vehicle a significant proportion will have a shortfall and the FCA recently said that shortfall is in, in excess of £50,000 yeah. so not an unmeaningful sum of money yeah. but again I think just go figure out exactly what position you're in you'd be surprised how much help and support your bank or building society will give you so go talk to them let, let them try to help great thank you so much thank you and to finish off Stefano we have a golden nugget from you my golden nugget is if you're moving abroad permanently and it's your intention to do works of reparation or renovation or building, do not take your brother, 
your mother, your father, your sister, as the expert electrician, joiner, whatever it may be, because it's the best way to displease the people that you will be living around. Your aim when you move abroad permanently is to make as many friends as possible. Want to learn the language, that's a must. You must learn, and English people think that everyone else is gonna speak English to them. Don't adopt that attitude, it's the best way to make enemies. Secondly, if you've got a, a joiner, don't take him across, you can take him across as a friend, but rules abroad are different for joinery, electrician, gas, whatever it may be. You must uh, take on board a local tradesman. It's the best way to make friends, it's also uh, the best way to have the work done correctly, so it doesn't fall foul of planning permissions and local rules and regulations, and those Bear in mind, those change from region to region, say in France or in Italy. So have an expert do it. Talk, if you're going to France, talk to the maire or the mairie. Uh, he or she will tell you who the best tradesmen in the area are and, and adopt that attitude. One, it helps you integrate and two, it will save you money because you won't have to have the job done again by an expert from the area who will have to put right the wrongs that someone who has done uh, a jobby uh, for you uh, may have done for you. Very different to us in England then. Well, we all have friends that are going to do... Well, I'm not saying don't take them across. Take them across, yeah. but, but don't use them as the be-all and end-all. Take them across Set only to advise. Take them on a holiday, absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Sadly, that's all we have time for right now, but please do keep your questions coming in via our website, www.property-tv.co.uk or email us at info at property-tv.co.uk. Thank you very much to our experts today. This has been Property Question Time. I'm Emily Evans. We'll see you soon.